So welcome uh, everyone. We'll begin uh, the session in a few seconds as you uh, make your way into the webinar. One of the staff members at ULI Toronto came to speak at Ryerson University and I just thought, you know, this is a great way to network and to meet people and to learn more about my city as well because they put on such great programming. To me, ULI has been a crucial part of my career development. Four years ago in Kensington Market, uh, there was a ULI walking tour where I met a senior city planner and uh, we developed a strong working relationship. That's a great thing about ULI is the opportunity to be uh, with like-minded people in, uh, in the industry. I've personally hired people from running into them at ULI and uh, led to a conversation and it grew into an opportunity to join our company. There are just so many opportunities for people of all ages to get involved as volunteers or just to attend the events and get involved. What's great about ULI is if there's that someone you've been wanting to meet and you haven't had the opportunity to do so, the roster of members is open. Take a look at who the members are. If that person's on the list, ask one of the ULI staff and they will make the introduction. Conversations that are happening, everything from the technology side of the business and incorporating uh, you know, new tech into development uh, and urban planning. That's rare to have that kind of um, an entity that can convene conversations from a whole variety of perspectives so that we can and a push and challenge each other to think a little differently about the solutions that might make a lot of sense. Now that I've been a part of ULI for seven years and that I volunteered for ULI, I, I hardly go by without going to an event and not knowing one person. And sometimes I actually find that um, there isn't enough time during the network portion of an event to talk to everybody that I know there. Join ULI to connect with people in the industry, to grow your career, and to give back So hi, welcome everyone and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Whittemore and I am the Commissioner of Planning and Building at the City of Mississauga, as well as a proud member of ULI Toronto Advisory Board. I'm pleased to welcome you here to today's session, ULI Toronto Mississauga Waterfront Rising. As a Toronto region-based organization, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on virtually, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anish Inabi, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wyandot peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. We will post a link in the chat to the program ULI titled 13,000 Years of Indigenous History in the GTA and why it matters to planning and development. We recommend watching it to learn the history and meaning behind the land acknowledgement. So before we start, um, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. Everyone will be automatically muted throughout the session to ensure there are no audio interferences. If you have questions for speakers, please use the Q&A function or upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up button. This session is being recorded and will be sent to you following the session. If you want to take the conversation online, please tag us with the handle at ULI Toronto, all small letters, or with the hashtag, hashtag ask great questions. And each of those words would have uh, begin with a capital letter. So uh, I'd like to also extend our sincere appreciation to uh, the sponsors for today's program. Um, today's event and all ULI programming would not be possible without the support of annual sponsors. On behalf of ULI, I'd like to thank them for their continued support. ULI Toronto relies on the support of our sponsors to provide quality program and to help drive our mission of creating and sustaining thriving communities. 
to all of them, we thank you. So now let's get down to business. We have a very tight one hour to explore a very rich amount of content uh, connected to the future of one of the GTA's most interesting urban frontiers. So I'm going to keep my setup relatively brief. Today's program is third in the new ULI Toronto webinar series, exploring the urban transformations of what we are calling the Greater Golden Horseshoes Edge Cities. As a chapter or district council of an international organization with deep roots in North America, ULI Toronto is proud to showcase the urban leadership of cities like Mississauga, who are reinventing themselves into vibrant urban cities of the future. As Mississauga's chief planner, it is an absolute pleasure to be moderating today's program, which includes three segments over the next hour. First, we're going to hear remarks from uh, Madam Mayor Crombie. Then we will host a panel discussion among local stakeholders, including Mayor Crombie. And finally, we will field questions from the audience, and they will be facilitated by Rob Spanier, past ULI Toronto Chair. So without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mayor Crombie, who has graciously agreed to join us while celebrating her birthday uh, today. A very happy birthday, Madam Mayor. Mayor Crombie and I have worked together over the last five years, and I can say without question that she is a very hardworking mayor with a strong vision for our city's transformation and with whom shares my passion for city building. Since first being elected as mayor in 2014, Mayor Crombie has worked diligently to improve the quality of life for Mississauga residents by holding the line on taxes, investing in, in improving traffic congestion, promoting an agenda of sustainability and resiliency, which includes building regionally connected transit and attracting major economic investment, all the while managing the growth of Canada's sixth largest city. Prior to being elected, Mayor Crombie served as the Ward 5 City Councillor and previous to that as the Member of Parliament for Mississauga Streetsville. Before entering public service, Mayor Crombie enjoyed 20 year career in business, working for Fortune 500 companies and starting her own business as an entrepreneur. Building regionally integrated transit, keeping Mississauga open for business, fostering innovation and creating a more open, engaging, inclusive and sustainable city have been Mayor Crombie's leading priority since taking office. The mayor has an MBA from the York York University Schulich School of Business and has earned a Corporate Director Certificate from the Institute of Corporate Directors at the Rotman School of Management. The mayor is proud to have raised three children, Alex, Jonathan, and Natasha, here in Mississauga. Mayor Crombie, the floor is yours. And to all well, those okay. listening, a reminder... <laughs> To Thank do you your for that very Andy. kind introduction, Andrew. I'm assuming you can all hear me. Uh, and I want to thank you, Li, for really suggesting this very interesting topic. I'm joined today for some other members uh, of my team, not only Andrew Whittemore, who is our commissioner, chief commissioner of planning and building, but Jody Robios, who is our director of parks, forestry, and the environment. Ben Phillips, who is the manager of planning and uh, leading the official plan update, but also the lead planner on the Brightwater site. Robert Trewartha, who is our director of strategic initiatives, whose job it is to make the waterfront a strategic priority for our city. And as well, Christina Giannone, who is the vice president of planning and development for the Port Credit West Village Partners. I'd also like to recognize two of my hardworking councillors who are joining us uh, today as well, but they're not going to be on the panel, unfortunately. Councillor Stephen Dasko of Ward 1, and who is actually the councillor responsible for both the Lakeview and the Brightwater site, and Councillor Karen Rass of Ward 2, both of whom are hardworking to make our waterfront a priority and realize its full potential. I'm delighted to talk to you about our waterfront today. As the mayor of Mississauga, I'm always ready to talk about my city and showcase to the world what we have to offer. 
I think the title of this presentation is fitting, Mississauga Waterfront Rising. Our waterfront is literally rising and changing as we speak in ways we could only dream of a decade ago. The growth and opportunity seem endless. And we have an opportunity to develop destinations and places where people from across the province and around the world will want to visit. If you haven't looked at Mississauga lately, it's time for you to do so. Mississauga has long been known as a bedroom community to Toronto, the place, the place people leave from in the morning and return to at night, but that's no longer the case. In fact, far from it. We are a net importer of jobs. Think about that for a minute. A, minute. a net importer of jobs. More people start and end their day in Mississauga than actually drive out to work somewhere else. With an annual GDP of over $60 billion, we're home to 75 Fortune 500 companies and over 94,000 businesses. We're building complete communities on our waterfront and in our downtown and in our uptown. We're building rapid transit to connect Mississauga to the wider GTHA and beyond. And we're building a new city and reimagining our communities. And right now, much of this work is being done on the waterfront. From culture to jobs and investment, innovation, sustainability, parks and open space, tourism and so much more, we're planning for and we are building great places. We're building a destination. Few cities can boast of 22 kilometers of waterfront and a large canvas on which to paint. But in Mississauga, we are investing in keeping our lakefront assets. We recognize that we have them. The development today is remarkable because of where we started. Think about it for a moment. Mississauga's waterfront used to be cottage country. Yes, we were the original cottage country and much closer than Muskoka is today. It was also home to some very heavy industries, some of which still remains today. There was little access to the water and certainly not a lot of vision for the future. Two sites in particular stood out, the Imperial Oil Site, which from 1959 to 1985 was a Texaco oil refinery at the foot of Mississauga Road and Lakeshore, and the OPG coal generating station at Lakeview. These two major industrial sites defined our waterfront for decades. That is until we took matters into our own hands. Some of you know the late Jim Toby, who was one of the waterfront councillors, the councillor for Ward Wonderful, Ward One, as he used to love to call it. He had an indomitable spirit. And through sheer force of will, he and the community joined together with city staff to undertake visioning uh, exercises both in Lakeview and in Port Credit and in the Marina Lands to see what these lands could become. They imagined a different future for our waterfront. After the Four Sisters came down at Lakeview in June 2006, the community stopped the proposed gas plant that was to replace them. Some of you may be familiar with the gas plant scandal. Their vision and ambitious work resulted in the Inspiration Lakeview Master Plan and Inspiration Port Credit. These visionary documents developed by the community and in collaboration with the city painted a picture of what was possible on our future waterfront. They envisioned sustainable mixed use communities, cultural amenities and vibrant communities with public art, parks and open spaces that bring people to the water and the water to the people economic and job creating opportunities, the potential for innovation and smart technology that would equip these communities to compete in the 21st century. They envisioned a new type of development in Mississauga, not cookie cutter subdivisions, but communities unique in their architecture and their built form, in their commitment to sustainability and in their, in their overarching goal to make the waterfront accessible to everyone. What's incredible is juxtaposing the current plans for Brightwater and Lakeview and the Port Credit Marina against the former industrial sites. It's a renaissance of sorts for Mississauga's waterfront, a rebirth for our city.
The problem was the city did not much, did not own much, if any, of that land along the waterfront. So it was very difficult to make this plan a reality. We needed committed development partners. And in 2017 and 2018, both happened. First, the Imperial Oil site was sold to a development consortium composed of Diamond Corp, Fram, Kilmer, and Dream. 72 acres online ready to be developed, well, soon. Then the Lakeview site was sold by the province and OPG to the Lakeview Community Partners, another development consortium comprised of Argo, TAC, Brandhoven, Green Park, and CCI. 177 acres online. Almost overnight, we went from having beautiful master plans with no sites to execute them on to having over 250 acres of waterfront land in play with cooperative development consortiums ready to get started. So we got to work and we're still working. I need to pause here to say that both development partners have been just that, partners in every sense of the word. There's always a back and forth, and you know that to be true when it comes to the development application process, but both development groups remain committed to building great world-class communities. Brightwater has processed more quickly and their 3000 units have been approved. This site also boasts of more than 300,000 square feet of commercial space with retail and a community common corridor running the length of the development from Lakeshore Road to the lake. The site dr draws people in and through to the water. At the base of the site is a campus and we continue to work with Brightwater Partners to realize the full potential of these buildings. With Lakeview, we enshrine the elements of the Inspiration Lakeview Master Plan into the official plan policies in 2018. This meant that the Lakeview partners were committed to delivering on the vision of the community and of the city. While we continue to work through the development approval process to bring 8,000 units and 180,000 square feet of commercial space online, we're also working on many of the strategic priorities that will set this site apart from any other that we have done in our city. And these priorities include vacuum waste and district energy that will offset 6,000 plus tons of GHGs annually, smart city technology that will enhance our city's reputation as the most connected city in Canada, an innovation corridor that will be home to innovative companies occupying 1.8 million square feet of employment space and over 9,000 good paying, highly skilled jobs a cultural district that will feature the creation of art and spaces for artists to make a living at their craft, all while animating the community. A game-changing public realm, complete with expansive parks and amenities and a fully connected waterfront trail. Creating a tourism destination like no other with the longest pier on this side of Lake Ontario as the central focus. If you haven't had a chance to get out on that pier, I'm sure the Lakeview Partners would be pleased to take you. The views are stunning. The Jim Tovey Conservation Area, a 64 acre reclaimed wetland using the fill from the former Lakeview Generating Station is a marvel of ingenuity and engineering made possible because of the vision of our late friend, the force of nature, Jim Tovey and a retail and a commercial hub full of restaurants and activities where you can spend a full day, no matter the time of year. We're currently working through the development applications and advancement of these strategic priorities. These two developments have pushed our teams across our corporation in ways that they have never been pushed before. These applications are as complex as they are unique. They involve many divisions within our corporations, as well as many multiple external stakeholders, including our partners at the region of Peel, the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority as well. I'm proud of the work we are doing and the vision that we are realizing 
a vision decades in the making. I've spoken at length about Brightwater and Lakeview as bookends to our current waterfront activities, but we also have other plans, including the Port Credit Marina, or putting the port back in the port, in, into Port Credit, as we like to call it. Working with Canada Lands, it is our plan to not only revitalize the marina itself, but also to build another mixed use waterfront community complete with reclaimed parkland, a destination for tourism, commerce and recreation, a place where people want to be. We have a strong business case, but we need the support of the federal and the provincial governments to make this project a reality. If you've been to Port Credit, you know that it's a bustling hub of activity in the winter and the summer. It hosts many festivals, is home to an active BIA, and is a hot real estate market. The face of Port Credit is changing and the redevelopment of Port Credit Marina will be a significant catalyst in this change. Port Credit is featured uh, a great deal in our various master plans for the city as a hub of innovation, culture, and economic growth. These developments and our goal to bring people to the waterfront has led to increased congestion on Lakeshore and the need to think about how we move people and goods through this corridor. We've developed the Lakeshore Connecting Communities Master Plan that guides the planning and investing in the transportation network in the Lakeshore Corridor, including decisions about optimizing roadways, improving public transit, and enhancing cycling and walking connections. Part of this plan includes the recently approved and announced Lakeshore BRT at the eastern end of Lakeshore, connecting it with Long, the Long Branch GO station. At the same time, we're looking east-west. We're also looking north and south. The soon to be built here Ontario LRT will terminate at the Port Credit GO station and bring people quickly and easily to the waterfront from all parts of Mississauga and beyond. From our downtown core to our growing uptown node, we're connecting all of our communities. We're moving, moving people is a key concern of ours if we're going to continue to develop along the Lakeshore corridor and the waterfront. It's why we're working with our development partners at Brightwater and at Lakeview to explore micro mobility solutions, including autonomous shuttles. We've modified the rights of way and turning radii on these sites and we're looking to reduce the amount of parking required. These are to be complete communities where people can choose to live without a car, but still connect to the rest of the city and the wider GTA. While Mississauga is moving full steam ahead on reclaiming our waterfront, we still have a long way to go. In 2019, our parks and forestry team revised our waterfront park strategy to realize the goal of building as much green space as possible between Lakeshore Road and Lake Ontario, but also to provide as many opportunities as possible to bring people to the water. This work will continue and remains a priority. So too does fully connecting the waterfront trail. It's an ambitious goal, but it's one that is achievable. One needs to look no further than Brightwater and Lakeview to see how we've expanded the trail and brought it back to the waterfront. It is my goal to see that this trail connect to the Credit River Trail that will one day run from the headwaters to the lake. We do not forget our past, which is why we're working with our First Nations partners to imbue the history of our Indigenous forebears into our work on the waterfront. We cannot forget the history of these lands and the important role our lakes and rivers played for the first peoples on this land. We have a vision. We are working to see it through. Our waterfront is literally and figuratively rising from its past towards a bright future. Waterfront developments in Toronto, like, Lake, like Ontario Place, get a lot of attention and rightly so, but people, need to take a look at what's happening a little further west. Take a look at what Mississauga is doing. When we're done, our waterfront will compete with the Chicago's, the Stockholm's and the San Francisco's of the world. So stay tuned and come on this journey with us. Thank you. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. That was uh, a wonderful overview of our waterfront's history and vision. Uh, and I hope you'll stick around to hear the panelists discussion, uh, whom, as you know, uh, have and continue to play a major role in the waterfront transformation uh, you've just spoken about. So for those of you that may have questions for the mayor or the panelists, please uh, type them in the Q&A box or, or the upvote. Uh, and uh, Rob will get to those at the end of the discussion. So uh, to begin, let's first uh, in briefly introduce um, our panelists. So Ben Phillips, uh, as the mayor had mentioned, is the manager of city official plan review process and has over 20 years experience at overseeing complex planning projects. Ben was the lead planner for the Brightwater development application at the city, which is the first of the major uh, applications in the redevelopment process. And Jody Robolos is the Director of Park, Forestry and Environment for the City of Mississauga. She's leading a team of professionals in the planning development, environmental sustainability and long-term success of parks along the waterfront. Christina Giannoni is the Vice President of Development for Brightwater team representing Kilmer, Diamond Corp, Dream and Fram and Slooker. Born and raised and now working in poor credit, uh, Christina and her team recognize the significance of Brightwater Development Site and its contribution towards Mississauga's waterfront redevelopment vision. And then finally, rounding up the panelists is Rob Twartha, who is the Director of Strategic Initi Initiatives in the office of our, our city manager. His responsibility is to champion the waterfront as a strategic priority and to coordinate corporate activities along the corridor to ensure we create an amazing waterfront. So I'm going to begin uh, the panelist discussion to with Ben. Um, and so most of us in the industry know that city planning is a complex process. The mayor just actually spoke of that, involving multiple stakeholders and the need to navigate complex legislative framework. So planning can be even more complex when dealing with infill and brownfill remediation development. So Ben, uh, perhaps you could start by speaking to the planning process and the key planning successes uh, you see coming out of these waterfront redevelopment plans. And perhaps you could also um, uh, speak to um, what you feel are the critical planning factors that led or will lead uh, to the waterfront successes. Uh, sure, thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'll just briefly touch on the planning process, but I think it is really rooted, uh, as the mayor touched on, uh, in terms of that Inspiration Lakeview process and the Inspiration Port Credit process. Um, the, uh, the Lakeview process started way back in, in 2020, uh, 2010 and went to 2014. So. Uh, that, as well as the, the one that was done for the Brightwater site, was really key in setting a vision uh, and exp expectations for everyone involved in terms of uh, the city, the public, those who lived in the surrounding communities, as well as the developers. So I think it really laid the foundations of success. So I think that that piece of being proactive and planning before the developers were even involved, before uh, the, the lands had changed hands was just really helpful and it, uh, it really got things going in the right way. Um, certainly there were the traditional development applications that were submitted first for Brightwater in 2017. That took a couple years, it, it really uh, wound up in 2019 and uh, really very similar for Lakeview after the lands were sold in uh, 2018, development applications were submitted. Uh, we're nearing the end of that process, but it's still still ongoing. So uh, just in terms of uh, the, the successes that, that I see as a planner coming out of that and certainly working on the Brightwater site, um, obviously a key one is reconnecting uh, to uh, the waterfront and really turning what could be a liability in terms of these brownfield sites into an incredible asset, having them cleaned up having them now connected through the many new parks and streets to Lake Ontario, 
um, is just uh, kind of a once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity, certainly as a planner, but for Mississauga. Um, I think also just creating truly complete communities on both of these sites is um, a key positive. They are truly uh, mixed use, they will be. Um, walkable, they will be urban. We're not replicating a suburban uh, situation. There are plans of subdivision as part of the, the, the formal process, but certainly when you look at kind of the, the range of uses, um, when you look at the fact that we really tried to be progressive in terms of um, urban form, the, the wide range of housing choices, that was certainly key. I think that's a key positive takeaway in terms of having, you know, not just uh, townhouses and uh, towers, but having a uh, mid-rise development, also having rental as well as ownership. We really wanted there to be affordable housing and really from day one, um, the developers understood that and were willing to talk about affordable housing and that's, uh, that's certainly part, part of this development. And I think too, just uh, being able to sensitively transition from the existing low rise neighborhoods on the edges, but still having uh, height and density and significant height and density, but just doing it in a way that is balanced and sensitive to those who are already uh, living there. Um, I think also just the extensive uh, public street and active transportation network. We really uh, worked hard on producing complete streets cycling lanes, um, sidewalk trees, but also integrating these uh, environmentally sustainable elements such as bioswales. So really getting that all right, getting the cross sections right um, was uh, I think a key positive. Also getting Lakeshore Road right in terms of having mixed use residential commercial, really continuing the main street um, that, that Lakeshore Road is into these new developments. Um, so those were, absolutely key. So um, your, your other question, Andrew, around really what were some of the key early decisions that led to these successes? I think uh, one of them, again, harkens back to starting the, the visioning and master planning earlier on, early on in the process. So engaging the community early on. Um, so that was a real, a real positive. I think doing the hard, the, the hard work of those several years of master planning, um, you know, deciding early on that, uh, you know, these sites would have destination waterfront parks um, that would be regional, have a regional draw in nature, um, getting the bones right, getting the street network right, getting the park network right, connecting those streets to the existing surrounding community. Again, that, that uh, getting the bones right, making sure it's truly urban. Um, and also, and the mayor touched on it, and I really found it to be true, seeing the landowners as community partners from day one, we set up bi-weekly bi meetings with a core group of city staff and the developers, even before the development applications started to really uh, understand where we were coming from, understanding their vision for these sites. And I think that was extremely helpful. Uh, it's a great relationship. I think we've built built out over over the two and three years that the applications have come in. Um, also, absolute key would be Lakeshore Road and transit along Lakeshore Road. And we know a BRT system is coming to the eastern part of Lakeshore Road and tying in to go transit further to the east. So uh, these things were were absolutely uh, you know it, uh, critical. Um, and my last point would just be trying to be innovative in terms of sustainability. Um, you know, we know about some of the, the technologies, district energy uh, being a key one. Um, yeah, so, so those are some of the key successes that I see coming out of this. Uh, thanks, Ben. The, that's a, a great uh, kickoff to the panelists' discussion. So I think now I'll go to um, Jody. Uh, perhaps as a follow-up to what Ben and the mayor have said. So we've heard a lot, Jody, today about the history of the waterfront and its former uh, industrial nature. Uh, clearly, those lands were not conducive for public access nor for recreating. Uh, yet now, through this development process, there is this tremendous opportunity to open up the waterfront for um, uh, residents, visitors, tourists, uh, to create a real destination. 
So, Jody, perhaps you could start by um, describing the city's long term plan for the waterfront park system. And maybe if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of the challenges that uh, you will need to overcome to realize that that uh, parkland waterfront vision. And really, again, um, both Ben and the mayor talked to the importance of uh, developer as a partner. So how would that look in uh, terms of the, the public realm space? Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me here today. Um, the city really started to look at the waterfront parks as a system in the early 2000s and developed our first waterfront park strategy in 2008. And some of the goals of the strategy was to look at exactly what the mayor has been talking about. How do we connect people along the waterfront and how do we connect people to the water? And uh, in both of the larger developments that we've been talking about with Lakeview and Brightwater, those were major gaps that were identified very early on in the park's waterfront uh, strategy. We updated the plan in 2019 to reflect changes with developments and also uh, to take a, a more focused look at the uh, Port Credit Harbor Marina and the One Port Street area and um, focus on how we can make that area an area of connection and, and public access. Uh, really, the, the goal is to create dynamic year round experiences and the city has a lot of existing parks along the waterfront. And um, they are very heavily used, um, even more so in this past year, I think we've seen in areas where we have people counting an over 300% increase in our utilization and our waterfront parks. So uh, very popular uh, facilities, but um, a lot of a lot of similar type of amenities along those parks, a lot of picnic areas, a lot of family focused amenities. And with the new developments coming in, it really gives us an opportunity to think about park spaces differently. And for us, it's really creating a different type of uh, park altogether. It's this waterfront destination park. Uh, it is more urban because it needs to fit into the developments and integrate into the great retail spaces that the developments are proposing. So I think the diversity of the community needs to be reflected in the diversity of the design for the parks. And th that's something that's been a big shift for us. And um, I think Ben mentioned, you know, it, this isn't a suburban model that we're looking at in, in our design and development. And, and it certainly isn't just a typical suburban parkland that we're looking at. Um, I think what's key for us and, and some of the challenges is these parks need to function on the sites as community parks for the people who live there. But we also know that they need to function as tourism and destination facilities and making sure that we have the right mix of amenities that really services not just Mississauga residents, the residents in the community, but a much broader um, a much broader group. And we saw this year buses coming in from other municipalities uh, to utilize our waterfront parks. And so uh, we, we know that Mississauga is already a destination and how do we uh, focus this a little bit more in terms of making it a sustainable destination. Sustainable design is key for us. Uh, we do have a climate change action plan and one of the pieces of that is really looking at resiliency. And we've seen um, some challenges with waterfront park designs over the last few years with rising lake levels. So making sure uh, those designs are, are right and sustainable in the long term. Um, and I'm going to put a plug in for funding in terms of uh, some challenges. So we have a, a development charge model, as, as everyone knows, is pretty uh, based on historical spending. And so when you're trying to do something new and different and creative, there isn't a lot of uh, examples that we can point to of typical types of things and, and sort of roll that into a development charge model. And so um, I will reiterate uh, the need to have other levels of government step up and support some of this great tourism uh, development and um, open space natural environment work that's going on uh, along our waterfront. And um, uh, we, you know, we need to do something different and that comes with a different thinking around how we fund these opportunities. So um, that's will be a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that we will overcome. And 
uh, with that uh, to tie into some of the conversation on the developer side of things, I think um, to emphasize what Ben and, and Madam Mayor were saying is, you know, at both Brightwater and Lakeview, we have developers who have a shared vision and that's, that's fundamentally key. Uh, and there's developers who they're developers who value parkland and open space and recognize the value of those in creating complete communities. So those conversations aren't just about you know built form, but they're also about how you know their residents will integrate and how um, how we can make those those uh, parks successful. And developers are frankly having great conversations with us around efficiencies and how we work together on the design and build of these facilities to uh, make, them, make them happen and to bridge some of that funding gap. And in both those cases, it's great to have Christina here today, but in both those cases, I think it's been a very different conversation than we've had previously in sort of the typical suburban development. Thanks, Jody. That was a, a great, uh, great insight into terms of how how you really uh, redevelop a waterfront from a public realm point of view. So, uh, I think now we'll we'll go to Christina because uh, we've we've been talking a lot about the developer's role in uh, waterfront. And Christina, you've had a uh, considerable experience developing in the city of Mississauga, not just on the waterfront. Uh, obviously, we hope it was a positive experience. Um, and as Madam Mayor had mentioned, really, I mean, I guess our philosophy of uh, planning and building is uh, that the developer is a partner in city building. So, you know, Christina, we've heard a very exciting vision uh, for the waterfront and we've heard uh, about the planning process and then Jody's um, emphasis on the importance of parks and open space and place making. So we're, uh, I was hoping that you could speak to um, the opportunities and challenges in undertaking a major waterfront development from a developer's perspective. Uh, and what, what would you say were uh, your major successes? And then maybe um, it'd be interesting to hear uh, your thoughts um, on what other developers might uh, want to consider in terms of waterfront development. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and, and Andrew, you mentioned that I have considerable experience in, in the city of Mississauga. It's funny, I was thinking back and uh, I think Ben Phillips was the first person that I called the first day on my job 15 years ago. So it, it goes back, Ben and I go back a long way, but um, I mean, everyone's been, what everyone's been saying um, is you've been hitting the nail on the head um, in terms of the whole idea of partnerships and, and how we've approached um, uh, development in the city and on the waterfront. So, I mean, in terms of um, the biggest opportunities, I'll try not to cover um, all the, I mean, everyone's been saying some really great points that, that uh, echo what we've been, what um, sort of I, I want to say and what I feel as well. Um, but I, the biggest opportunity um, really for, for our site and waterfront development is creating a world-class complete community within an already world-class city. Um, the opportunities, as has been said, uh, don't come around often. So when it does, um, we as developers have a major responsibility to get it done right. Um, I'm lucky enough to work for an incredible group of partners with Kilmer Group, Diamond Corp, Dream and Fram Slocker. Um, who each bring their expertise to the table in planning, building, remediation, leasing, and infrastructure. Um, we, we've also brought on world-renowned designers and consultants, and that's something that we felt was really important. Um, we also held an international design process, selection process, uh, because a community of this scale and importance warrants d design diversity, and we want to raise the bar in design. We have an opportunity to showcase the waterfront, um, and what we put there needs to be special, not only in the architecture and urban design, but also the public realm, as Jody was saying. And so aligning the vision and planning um, is, was, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's an incredible opportunity because there's no question that the waterfront is a special place. Everyone wants to be close to the water. So that means that there's a lot of stakeholders around the table and, and rightly so. Um, and the vision means something different um, to those stakeholders. And for us, that included city staff, regional staff, Credit Valley Conservation, the province through the MNRF and the MECP, 
school board, existing residents, um, neighbors, us as developers, and future businesses and, and tenants. So there's a lot of people that we have to take into consideration. Um, but through the idea of we're all partners in this, um, we took that approach. Um, it's important, um, and, and, and we took a different approach in that we did meet with staff on a regular basis. And um, I remember our meetings, we sat around a big circular table and we threw out ideas and, and it was very collaborative. It wasn't a siloed approach where different divisions don't speak to each other and have different ideas. We all sat around the table. We, um, our, our team also met with uh, ratepayers associations on a regular basis. And so from the very beginning, it was a partnership um, to get the waterfront right from the beginning. Um, so sometimes the process, we need to think about the rule book differently um, in terms of um, the applications, not only the applications, but then um, um, some standards um, and policies. And so we worked with staff to think differently on both of our ends as to what that would mean um, for an infill um, waterfront development. And so we were able to do that. Um, like examples were the rights of ways, um, prioritizing active transportation, um, reduced parking standards. So things like that um, got us thinking differently. Um, and then, I mean, a couple things I won't get into as much, but a couple of the bigger challenges that we faced were addressing traffic. I mean, uh, Ben um, mentioned that as well and the, um, what the city's initiatives are on that and how developers are contributing um, to thinking about uh, mobility solutions as uh, Madam Mayor had, had raised. Um, responsibility and innovation and sustainability, we take that to heart. Um, we're on the waterfront, we're right up against nature. And so we need to respect that and um, recognize what our role is in, in maintaining that and improving that um, for our site. And then remediation expertise. Um, we were an industrial site. Uh, it took a lot of upfront capital and efforts to bring it up to a, um, a stage that we can develop it. Um, that's something that um, we, we felt was extremely important um, from the get-go and we were able to um, take on that, that challenge um, to bring it to what um, the, the uh, award-winning vision that our team, um, our, when I say team, I mean like the city and everyone at the table um, has created. So those are sort of like a couple of the opportunities and challenges. I think you also asked um, um, about uh, what other developers might want to consider. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking at waterfront development, uh, take the opportunity and if not, then call me because I will want to take that opportunity. Um, but a couple of the things that I wanna say are like, don't underestimate placemaking. Uh, waterfront development is more than just views. Uh, it's it's a lifestyle. We've seen where waterfront developments can can be done wrong, um, and so um, I explain it because born and raised in South Mississauga. Uh, whenever I walk down in Port Credit, um, I like to say that it feels like a vacation when I'm lucky enough to call it home. So um, to me, it's the experience. Even if you don't have a water view, you still feel it, um, and that to me is what waterfront what makes a great waterfront development. Um, and surround yourself with expertise. So again, these are once in a lifetime opportunities. Waterfront is a destination. Um, and so you have that ability to showcase, uh, you need to get it done right. So surround yourself with the best people. Um, and those are some of like the big points that I want to cover. I've got, I mean, I got lots to say, so we can, we can get <laughs> to it, uh, in the questions and answers. Thanks, Christina. That's uh, great. In fact, I think we are uh, running a little bit tight on time. So uh, with Rob Tawartha, I was going to go to you next. Uh, if you could really touch on some of the highlights on uh, how the city is working with our development partners and other levels of government to really uh, drive the projects that will ultimately transform uh, the corridor into a destination for investment job creation, innovation, and uh, creativity. And then we'll go to questions and answers. 
Sure, and thanks for letting me run the anchor leg here, uh, Andrew. Um, you know, and I would be remiss, and I, I'm glad Jody raised it. One of my other hats that I wear is intergovernmental relations, and so you know we can't build uh, these great places in isolation. And the great places that we're trying to build also come with great price tags. So, you know, if there are federal or provincial government uh, representatives on the call, we do look to you as partners, uh, and we'll be you know trying to work with you in the future uh, to to build this waterfront. Um, as you've heard from many of the panelists, uh, including the mayor, we've put a lot of thought and effort into building a destination waterfront, and our, our focus has really been on building great places. And this includes attracting investment, fostering innovation, and building spaces for creativity and engagement. Um, economic development and cultural uh, vibrancy have really been key pillars of both the inspiration plans that have been talked about, but also our city's strategic plan going back to 2009, and it's true now as it was then. Uh, the waterfront also features prominently in our culture and economic development master plans, both of which have been recently updated. And there's a large focus in both of them on place. Uh, and it's really a new way of us thinking about uh, how we do development, specifically economic development. You know, we have many attractive attributes in this city that the mayor has spoken about at length, but the waterfront gives us a real opportunity to sell something different that may that many people are looking for. I think Christina said a lifestyle. You know, we're looking to develop communities where people can live and work, where they can access good paying jobs at the same time as world class culture and recreational amenities while also enjoying a high quality of life and uh, also living sustainably. Uh, we're looking at the entire waterfront corridor in this in this fashion and, and making sure that we connect all of these developments uh, across what you know the local councillor calls the waterfront ribbon, the 22 kilometers from Lakeshore south to the water. Um, and that's why, you know, when we talk about economic development and, and connecting these communities, you know, transit is so important. The mayor spoke about the BRT. The same is true of the network of fiber and Wi-Fi that we're putting into the ground along the corridor in all the different developments. Uh, we are the most connected city in Canada, and we need to talk about that a little bit more, I think. Uh, but we're literally laying the infrastructure that will connect people uh, and businesses across that corridor and into the rest of the city. You know, this is really Mississauga's opportunity to step out on the world stage in a big way and take some of the spotlight that's maybe been reserved for other cities in the past. I won't go into too much detail, but, you know, from an economic perspective, you know, Brightwater boasts 35,000 square meters of retail and commercial space. The site's going to generate over a thousand jobs. Um, but I would like to focus just a little bit on the, the opportunity that exists at the campus uh, at the southeast corner of the site that, you know, the culmination of that grand promenade that runs down the center. You know, we're envisioning that to be a destination in and of itself, a place for learning, for innovation, for creativity, and really that collision of ideas. Uh, and we're working closely with uh, the team at Brightwater uh, to find a, an institutional or post-secondary uh, tenant that will occupy that space and really bring it to life and bring people into the site and then down to the water. And of course, Brightwater sits uh, right adjacent in, in Port Credit, uh, which in and of itself is already a cultural node in our city's master plan and a place that we're really projecting to spend heavily in the years to come on public art, public spaces, festivals, and uh, to really make it a destination. Destination. And then, of course, to the east, uh, we have Lakeview, which is also rising quickly. Um, and the mayor spoke about some of the uh, some of the, the stats around that. But I'd really like to focus on the potential that is the innovation corridor, uh, which runs down the eastern core, the side of the site. And it's uh, about 1.8 million jobs or, or sorry, 1.8 million square feet we're projecting of employment space, but also sort of 9000 long term uh, good paying jobs. Uh, the district itself is about 47 acres, and I wish I had a map in front of me to show you here, but, you know, it's split be between public and private ownership, uh, and it starts in the north with our small arms inspection building, which is a uh, cultural hub uh, for the city of Mississauga, and then culminates on the waterfront in the Searson campus, where again, we're looking for an institutional or post-secondary anchor uh, right on the waterfront. Our vision is really on this corridor to attract cutting edge businesses and institutions focused on science, technology and culture, and also other major industries in Mississauga that we're, we're quite steeped in from advanced manufacturing, life sciences and clean tech. Our goal with these sites uh, along the corridor is to elevate Mississauga as a major hub of regional and global uh, innovation and really to put us into that ecosystem in a way that we aren't now. 
Uh, and in fact, I would encourage you all to look for uh, some of the work that we're going to be doing from our Economic Development Office in the, the months to come to activate the Innovation Corridor. We'll be hosting sessions with industry and business to see how we make the highest and best use of these lands and how we can really achieve our, our vision there. As part of the 67 acres that is also coming to the city, we're also planning for an innovation and cultural hubs uh, down on the waterfront as well. And if you can see the master plan, you'll see that these sites all sit at the heart of the action uh, where people naturally gather uh, at the head of the iconic pier that the mayor talked about that'll become a tourism destination. And, you know, waterfront tourism is going to become a major priority for us in the week, in the, in the years to come in a way that it hasn't been uh, to date. Um, and our culture and innovation campuses are immediately adjacent in this site to Lakeview Square, which is a space that will be marked by unique retail. Uh, it'll have restaurants, activations, installations. And the whole area we're, we're envisioning becomes a confluence of innovation, creativity, and human interaction in a place where arts and culture are not only incubated, but they come, come yeah, sorry, excuse me, collide with innovative businesses. We're really trying to create destinations where people want to be. Uh, and that's really what we're striving for here, creating a place where people want to live, to work and to play with an amazing quality of life. So, you know, I know that I'm running the anchor leg and I'm up against the questions here, but, you know, we're looking at economic development differently. There's an extreme amount of potential here for these sites uh, to become investment destinations for our city. And, uh, you know, that's really what we're looking to do uh, in, the, in the years to come. So thank you for having me on the panel today. And maybe we can get into more of this in the questions. Okay, th so thank you very much, Rob, and to all the panelists. And so now I'm going to turn it over to the other Rob uh, to facilitate any questions that uh, it looks like we do have some. Yeah, so. so much. You guys did such an incredible job on the discussion that we had budgeted 10 minutes and I don't even have them. So what we're going to do is the following. I'm going to ask one question to the mayor and I'm going to give the mayor 60 seconds because we're going to see if we can jump to other questions. If we can't, I've discussed with the ULI team and we will actually uh, record all these questions and we may have a follow-up event because this is clearly an incredible discussion to unpack. So Madam Mayor, what differentiates the major new community developments underway on Mississauga's waterfront from other jurisdictions? Second part, what are the main elements making them uniquely successful? Well, I think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity no matter where you look and you can look abroad globally, whether it be in, in the US, in Chicago, in San Francisco, or in Europe, in Copenhagen, or in Stockholm to develop uh, 250 acres of waterfront land, you know, in, in, on two different developments plus the marina. And we've done it, as you've heard, in consultation with the community so that they have the opportunity to design the vision of what they want to live beside. Uh, we, it, the, some of the features include, uh, Rob talked about placemaking, space making, making it interesting, making it a draw, ensuring that it becomes a destination, not only a place where people want to live, work, invest, raise kids, but tourism as well, economic development. Um, and so what was the rest of it? <laughs> I think I pretty much answered the crux of it. It's, it's a very unique opportunity. Uh, they're cutting edge developments, employing all the latest of technologies, whether it's smart city technology, vacuum waste, district energy, everything that we can think of. We want to make this the most progressive cutting edge uh, portion of our city uh, and, and, and feature all of those on these two sites. So I think that pretty, why don't we give some others? There's a couple more questions. So. I've also learned in my years of experience, always allowing the mayor to have the last word is usually a good idea, especially <laughs> on her birthday. Um, what I will tell you is that the questions were ranked and that was the top ranked question. Uh, the second top ranked question related to uh, bicycle sharing. And Jody, I would have asked you that question, but we can't get into it, but I certainly wanna make sure we handle it. Affordable housing, uh, we covered it slightly, but I would have asked Christina, what are you doing about affordable housing? How many units do you have at Brightwater? What is the plan? What's the plan for Lakeview? So those are some of the questions. Lots of great questions about social sustainability, uh, infrastructure. How do you make sure that this actually gets executed? Because while visions are great, implementation is truly the key to success. And I think that the legacy of uh, the mayor and of the city and of staff is about making sure that these projects get implemented. Uh, questions about ensuring that we have a voice at the table for the Indigenous groups, which I know that these projects do have. Um, and again, allowing commercial, in uh, commercial and retail in parks. 
don't separate church and state. How do you include both of these things? And I know Jody's thinking about these ideas on many projects along the water. So with one minute to go, on behalf of ULI Toronto and our membership committee, I wanna thank Mayor Crombie, Andrew, Christina, Ben, Jody, and Robert, uh, really for bringing a great discussion to the fore about the waterfront. I truly believe that this is one of the most exciting opportunities in Canadian history. Uh, a city that has multiple developments uh, really strung together like a jewel or, or a necklace of opportunities uh, is something to watch. So for those of you who have just started to learn about this, stay tuned and certainly uh, reach out. And I think that ULI will have more to come on this. Also, thank you to our members and guests and certainly our sponsors. Um, in terms of some upcoming events, you'll see them up on the screen if we can switch the screen. Some really exciting events. Uh, one of the testaments that I learned from our past chair Last Klein is to always end on time. So take a look at the upcoming events that are coming. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day, everybody.